All right, everyone, I think we have a quorum, so we're going to begin. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to a webinar, and thanks for spending your uh, afternoon or morning or evening with us. Depending on where you are, we have lots of registrants from uh, all around the world, so we appreciate your support and uh, coming out today to take a look at what's new in Generate. Uh, so again, my name is Kevin Schofield. I'm the Vice President of Technical Marketing here at Frustum. Um, what I'm going to do is go through, um, we'll probably spend about 20 to 25 minutes here online today. I'm going to start off just by showing a few slides just to kind of get oriented. And uh, then I'm going to launch into a live demonstration. We're going to walk through and show um, uh, several things. We're going to show some of the features and capabilities of Generate, obviously. And then uh, we'll, we'll take some questions at the end. So without further ado, let's get started. Um, first of all, I want to introduce Generate. This is our interactive generative design solution. Uh, we've got some new branding and logos. We're rolling out a new product um, that we're very excited about. Many of you may have heard about us um, through the last week or so. Uh, we received a lot of industry publications that have reached out to us and covered our announcement from last week. We did a, uh, an appearance at Develop 3D Live. And uh, so many of you hopefully found your way to this webinar, perhaps as a result of that. Uh, and we appreciate your support there. Um, please visit our website. If you'd like to read the press release, we've got it up there as well. Wanted to first kind of talk about what is generative design? We get asked this question a lot uh, as being in this space. Uh, people are very familiar with CAD modeling, with drafting, with uh, additive manufacturing, but generative design is still a term that uh, needs to be pinpointed sometimes for folks. So the way we see it, it's a design paradigm where users specify functional requirements for a product and the design is automatically generated. And what that means in short is you tell the part what it needs to do functionally and the software figures out the best geometric shape for that. And of course you can mix in design constraints. So if you have a printer, if you have a five axis machine, if you have a water jet cutter, uh, you're going to be able to apply different constraints. And we're actually going to do some of those live during the demo. Now, what's different about this version of Generate is it's interactive. And so what is interactive generative design? Well, again, as we see it, it's a, it's a paradigm where at any time during the process, the user can see immediate results and interact with and alter that result by adjusting the functional requirements. So there's a, a GIF playing that you can kind of see a sneak preview of what you're going to do. evolves in front of you, uh, albeit not quite as fast as the video shows, but still uh, the shape can be created. And while it's being created, you can adjust parameters. So it's applied a load and you're getting a strange displacement that's not what you expected, you can go in and change that. So to us, interactive generative design means you are interacting with those results and making changes um, in, in near real time. A Couple of quick highlights of Generate. Uh, first of all, obviously it's interactive topology optimization. We produce manufacturer ready output. That's a big distinguishing feature of Generate relative to some of the other tools out there meaning you can output this file and go straight to manufacturing without having to remodel in CAD. We'll talk a little bit more about that during the live demo when we've got a model on screen. I'll try to explain what that really means. Uh, Real-time FEA, so as we're going, you can turn on your uh, stress results and see either the displacement or the stress results in real time. So you can start, again, can interrupt if you see a stress riser occurring and you wanted to change an input, maybe you had something in incorrect, you can make those changes. We also allow native CAD file import uh, using uh, one of the popular CAD translators. So uh, virtually any CAD or neutral file format can be imported. We use single bodies or assemblies. So in the example actually you see on screen, uh, there's, two, there's two bodies there, the pin and then the design space for that bracket. Um, you can work with just a single body if you wish, but uh, I'll show some examples of working with uh, both single bodies and assemblies. Uh, you can obviously load in your materials. Uh, any materials you want can be defined. And lastly, it's a Windows-based application. And when I point this out because uh, as some of you might know, you might know of Frustum, and we have a product called Generate, which is a web-based product um, currently. It's been out for 
several years now. It's very popular. Uh, this is our first Windows-based application, and we did that to um, allow companies that are perhaps behind firewalls and don't want to let their data, sensitive data, uh, be uploaded to the cloud. Uh, you also want to be able to leverage things like your local GPU, which we can now do using this desktop-based version. And I'll show you in a minute, and I'll kind of go through what I'm demonstrating it on, and that'll give you an idea for uh, the speed that you'll expect to see. One quick thing to, to point out is if you've seen traditional topology optimization or simulation packages, one downside is that the resulting geometry is more inspirational than manufacturable. So the designs have to be remodeled in CAD. That uh, maroonish data you see on the left is not NURBS data, it's not BREP, uh, it's just essentially chunky facets. It's not suitable for manufacturing for machining or for 3D printing. So the generate strives to do is to output manufacturer ready geometry so as these models as you dynamically update things the result even if you pause at any time the result is going to be something that you can actually go manufacture that won't have sharp sharp edges where you don't want them uh, it won't have undercuts if you don't want them you can define extrusion directions build directions for add to manufacturing and so on and a couple quick pictures. Um, optimizing for manufacturing, as I just talked about, is very important. So optimizing for additive, where you're a little bit less constrained in some cases, depending on whether perhaps it's a powder-based build or a resin-based build. Optimizing for casting, we can actually find parting lines. Um, if you define the pull direction, we'll actually create uh, a part that can be pulled out of a two-part mold for you. Uh, or optimize for machining. Um, so I, Part things like water jet cutters, 2D, um, simple 2 to 2.5D machining, or even if you want to make a real simple part, even on a five axis machine, we can dictate extrusion directions to help out. And now enough slides, let's get to the demo. So I know everyone wants to take a look at Generate. So um, I'm gonna flip over here, wait for the screen to catch up. There we go. So um, what you'll see uh, over here, um, excuse me, in the middle of the screen is our, um, this is our design space, sort of in a tan color, this kind of beige color. And we've got two pins that intersect it. So what we're gonna do is treat this as a very basic assembly where with these two pins are essentially imparting forces or interacting with that design space, all right? I wanna start simple and then we'll kind of move on to real parts towards the end, but I thought this would be very good to sort of explain how this process works. The first thing you have to do is define your, what we call it the generative body. So what is our design space? So in this case, it's what's called body one in a tree. And this just means, this is like our sandbox. This is the area, the volume within which we can grow the part to unite these two pins. Now, the next step is gonna be, we're going to create what we call interactions. And this is just a step where we can uh, essentially preserve material at interfaces around the part. So here, I'm gonna create two different interactions. Create another one here, a little smaller. Uh, I can edit those. So if I wanted to edit that uh, interaction between let's say body one, and body two, I can, we can make it a little smaller, we can reduce the size um, of the, the kept material or the retained material. You would do this if you were, for example, gonna uh, tap the hole, you wanna leave a certain amount of material there around that interface, or maybe you just wanted to have that pin glued in place. You wanna make sure it contacts all the way around. So you wanna dictate that you wanna leave a certain amount of material around those interfaces. Now we're gonna set up some forces and constraints. So in this case, we're gonna just apply a simple um, moment, essentially. We're just gonna take this pin on the right, we're gonna twist it. Um, we're just gonna pick an edge here to use as a, just a, a graphical way of selecting what is, what is essentially the Y axis. And in this case, we'll just apply a thousand pound force, uh, uh, pound force per inch. So a really kind of strong moment sort of twisting on that body. And then we're gonna go up here and we're gonna fix this pin on the left. So we're gonna actually fix it in space. So we've got a fixed constraint. You can see the little glyphs that appear over top just to let us know we've got some load cases or we've got some boundary conditions that we've set up. 
And then last thing we're going to do, almost to the point of creating generative geometry, is we have to identify um, what our material is. So like I said, we have some standard materials, and I should point out, um, this is uh, uh, still a pre-release version that I'm dealing with or I'm showing here today. It doesn't have uh, all the capabilities, but this material list will grow from the first release. Uh, every subsequent release will continue to add materials eventually up to and including additive manufacturing specific materials, for example. So libraries from some of your favorite 3D printing companies will be in here. Uh, you can see where I added Inconel 718 the other day. So we can actually dictate which materials you want to use. In this case, we'll just choose aluminum. And then last thing we have to do, we've fed the, the, the design space has almost everything it needs. We've got loads and constraints. We've got uh, the material that we want to be retained and we've designed a, a material to the part. All we need to do now is dictate what to uh, do, what the generative target is. In this case, I'm just gonna do a relatively simple 25% weight reduction. So what that means is um, show me a part that can withstand the loads, but that is 25% of that original volume. So you see it starts to build and as uh, um, as promised, this is not a video or anything. You're seeing some updates about every four or five seconds. And in the lower left corner, I'm keeping an eye on my current mass. Uh, and I'm also looking at this uh, what we call the generator down in the bottom left, not surprisingly. And the generator is sort of an always on, always watching optimizer. So as soon as it has all the inputs necessary, it'll start to optimize the geometry. And so, so it's done actually, there's a check mark. So it's done with that iteration. Uh, if I wanna check the results, I can pull this up and I can see my initial mass and then what it reduced it down to. Uh, I can also turn on my stress results. So if I wanna see the, the magnitude of stresses uh, in the part and where they occur, uh, what's also very helpful I find is to turn on the displacement magnitude and switch the map over to that and then animate it simply so that you can see this is a good sanity check that you set up your load cases in the right way. So make sure that yes, we would expect to see a twisting motion at that location. And then of course, like any measuring the exact displacement, okay? So we're gonna turn the FEA back off for a second. All right, we're gonna do um, something that is again, a bit unique to, to generate. Let's say I wanted to make a slight design tweak. I wanted to see what would be the net impact of moving this pin inward just a little bit. What I can do is I can actually just click on it, drag it, I can, as you can see, either type in a number. In this case, I'll just drag it roughly a quarter of an inch. And as soon as I do, presto, it goes off resets and says, I've got new parameters, new inputs, let's go rebuild this geometry. And so it goes off and it starts to rebuild. Now, um, a couple of things while it's doing that, um, you may find that your part is asymmetrical. So even though the load case is symmetrical, in some cases you'll get an asymmetrical result, we can add a plane of symmetry. So if we wanted to, we could go back into uh, the main generative body and click on uh, one of our design constraints. And we're gonna do a few more of these design constraints in another part here in just a second. Uh, things like extrusion and self-supporting, but for now, we'll add a plane of symmetry. And you can see we just pick two planes, creates a bisector right down the middle. And again, because that's now a new input, you're gonna see the process start all over again. And it'll start to regenerate using what is now a plane of symmetry. So we can move the part around, we can change materials, we can change the loads and constraints um, on the fly using Generate. And this is obviously a part that's manufactured primarily would be additive, of course, it'd be very difficult to get a five axis machine in there, if not impossible. So um, what we're gonna show next is ways to constrain the design based on your manufacturing constraint or based on what you want your uh, manufacturing to a different part. It's the little lever part, which if any of you happen to have caught the speech that was broadcast last week that Jesse Blankenship, our CEO, and I did over uh, at uh, Develop 3D Live in Boston, you might have seen this uh, this little demo. But essentially we have, again, so have a design space, relatively basic, a couple of pins that interact. Here we've already got set up a pin joint and a fixed constraint. So we're just gonna add a force. So the first thing we gotta do is what we did before, which is go in here now and add an interface here. So in this case, we're gonna add a, about a four tenths of an inch offset around that. 
and then we're going to apply a load and we're just going to apply in this case a force last time we used a moment this time we'll just apply a simple force of let's say a thousand pounds pulling down in the negative y direction all right and then we'll turn on make sure we use that force for the load case and then the last thing we got to do is we haven't defined a material so we'll go in here and this time let's choose titanium uh, now again the first result is unconstrained, meaning we're, we didn't apply any design constraints. We want to just kind of see what our baseline is, what we're starting with. You'll start to get an idea for how the system thinks this, this type of part should be shaped to withstand the load conditions that we've given it. And you can see some sort of kind of a, we call it material spreading, but it's sort of a webbing that occurs. Uh, that's also something that can be controlled if you want more of a thicker slab-like result uh, versus uh, thinner multiple webs you have control over that as well through a constraint we call material spreading. Now, so this is gonna run for a few more seconds and we're getting a, a nice result. Uh, again, more suited to 3D printing. You could machine it though. But let's just add a design constraint to this. So in this case, we're gonna add an extrusion constraint. So I'm gonna click this bottom face, say okay. And again, because it's a new constraint, it's gonna go off and start to uh, regenerate a new result. The difference here is it's sort of like a two and a half D projection. So as it starts to grow, if I rotate this around and I'm gonna hide, go back up here and hide the uh, design space, make it a little easier to see. You'll see how it has a flat bottom, almost as if it's being grown off of that plate, all right? And so this is really, again, something that would be relatively simple to, to uh, machine. Uh, also, it would be relatively simple to 3D print because you would have no support structures. So you'll get uh, a similar result to what we had before, slightly different shape. Again, uh, same mass because we use the same mass target that we did originally. And then let's go back here and we're going to hide, or excuse me, we're going to show our assembly again. Go back to our design space. And this time I'm going to delete that extrusion constraint. I'm going to add a different one. I'm going to do it a slightly different way this time. This time we're gonna add what we call a bi-directional constraint. Now this would create what we saw in that slide deck, which is sort of a two and a half D, or excuse me, a 2D profile uh, suitable, again, most of like water jet or laser jet cutting. So the whole message here is that there's multiple design constraints. We have five or six already in the application. We have several more queued up for next versions, next iterations of Generate um, that we'll look to expand. Um, I'm actually gonna switch to a, a different part now and show you another design constraint and a few more features of the Generate tool as this continues to, to build and it's uh, almost done now. So uh, let's go over and I'll open up uh, a third part. It's a part we call the cantilever. Again, generate web users might be familiar with it. We've got similar design available there. And let's get this oriented. So what this is, is uh, let's hide these bodies for a second in the middle. And I'm gonna kick off the optimization here. So we've already got a load case defined. We've got uh, some fixed constraints some forces and moments applied. And so it's gonna start to gener regenerate, or excuse me, generate a optimized design within that design space. One thing though, um, you saw those bodies, those blocks that I had in here. These might represent passageways for wire harnesses or pipes or tubing that you wanna make sure are cleared. So you wanna provide some clearance in that space. So we can do that and we just simply go in and create what we call separated interactions. So here, let's just give it a little bit of relief, about a 10th of an inch around each of these guys. Say, okay. And so now you're gonna see something else happen. It's actually gonna now grow and create the part while still maintaining the properties and maintaining the structural integrity, but it has to grow around those shapes. So you can see if I put it into kind of a plain view here. Now, again, I don't have any design constraints. These aren't really design constraints as we call them. These are just simply uh, ways in, of dictating how parts interact with each other. Um, I'm gonna hide these little bodies just for a second so you can see that result. Okay, so let's go to experiment now with one other design constraint. Um, so let's go back into our generative body. And in this case, we're gonna add one called self-supporting. And so self-supporting means uh, I'm actually going So it's almost like pretending like it's gonna be growing uh, off a build plate, which is now, I've, I'll try to put it at the bottom of the screen here. And then we'll apply a 15 degree 
um, restriction on overhangs. So what you're gonna see is a little bit different result. Now it's gonna look um, like something that was uh, built off of a build plate and sort of grown upwards in the Z direction. And so you can kind of see it from the top down here. And then if we rotate to the back, you'll see how the back face is mostly planar because we're trying to reduce the amount of overhangs. So this is one of a, you know, again, one of five or six as time goes by and continuing to develop this product. Uh, we're very excited to get this first version out here with this tool set and then uh, work with our customers to learn what they need and, and grow this into um, um, the you know, best in class generative design tool that it is. One last thing, and then we'll um, um, move on. But I do, I do want to point out, again, just sort of showing as we go with each part, when we talk about manufacturability, you know, notice there's no like sharp edges or cusps that appear anywhere on here. Uh, the blending is and the smoothing of the geometry, that's what's enabled by our true solid geometry kernel. You may have seen, uh, if you follow Frustum, you've seen announcements about our true solid API or true solid kernel. That's really the underpinnings of what you know, generate can do is all based on true solid. And it's the ability to model these uh, volumetrically um, while maintaining continuity of the surfaces, smoothness of the surfaces without all that chunkiness that we saw in one of those other examples. That's really what, what gives generate uh, the big advantage is the true solid API running in the background. Just wanted to point that out. Uh, one other quick example and something I wanted to show, uh, it's a good example of a little bit more of an assembly is this uh, little landing gear assembly. Uh, again, just a relatively simple little design. Uh, you can see this design space in it's, which is transparent. And then in just a second, there we go. And it'll update and you'll see the generative body. Now, obviously I set this part up prior. I didn't, uh, this one has a few different load cases. Uh, otherwise it only takes about five minutes to set up and get everything assigned, get your materials assigned. Um, but you can see the net result um, of this shape where we've taken apart. In this case, looks like it was reduced from about 115 pounds down to about 73 pounds, uh, given the different load conditions. Um, one other thing to note too, is everything I've shown today has been a single generative body. Uh, we can also do multiple generative bodies. In fact, um, I was working on a different version of this part where we create a generative body of this, like what I call it the hinge. It's basically just sort of like a, uh, it provides the pivot point for that other fitting. Uh, there's, you can do multiple generative bodies simultaneously. You can have, and like in this case, we've got a pin here and this pin can be fixed and it can apply to both and be attached to both parts, both this uh, colored part or orange colored part and the and the uh, the blue fitting at the bottom. So just because I didn't show multiple generative bodies, just want to make sure it's known that that is certainly possible. All right. Um, well, I wanted to leave time for Q and A. We wanted to keep this to about a half an hour. Um, so um, if there's any questions, I'm actually going to take a minute and we're going to take a look at the the question panel uh, and see if there's any questions that we want to get start uh, get answered for you. Um, one question did come in, um, which was, um, um, if you're familiar with Generate Web, obviously it's a topology optimization. Um, so I'll just quickly talk about what the differences are between the two. Uh, to Generate Web also leverages the True Solid API. It is a cloud-based option. Um, you basically is a to um, the number of optimizations you can run um, and limited to what you can download. Uh, but it's only for single body. Uh, you can only do a single part of time. You can only do a step file currently. So you're limited in your inputs. Um, you also um, can only do uh, sort of a limited set of the design constraints uh, relative to what we're gonna be putting in to generate. So generate for de the desktop application, um, you know, you've seen hopefully the speed here where I was doing these optimizations in real time. None of this was pre-recorded and we're leveraging the GPU. So if you have an NVIDIA CUDA card, 
um, you can leverage that to to really get a big speed boost um, on top of your you know CPU that's used. Um, so um, that's one of the main differences um, in there. Um, and is the version fully standalone was another question. Uh, yes, it is. You don't need to be attached to the cloud. Uh, it was another um, common mistake or common misconception was that we're still somehow leveraging our cloud API. We're not. Uh, this is all fully isolated, siloed within your computer. Just for reference, I'm using a Dell laptop. I'll call it sort of a mid-grade CAD quality laptop. It can run your standard CAD packages. But if you benchmark it against a standard desktop machine, it it comes up short. So your, your mileage will vary, but if you have a really nice desktop machine, like a CAD workstation, you're gonna see even faster updates. Um, so one thing I did wanna talk about, yeah, I had a question uh, about lattices. So um, it reminded me to finish the uh, rest of my presentation here, which I had a few slides for you that I wanted to show. And that is, you know, to answer the question, well, what's the future for Generate? You know, what's coming? What are we gonna be doing? Um, this part sums it up pretty nicely in that Generate will be a, a blend of technology that will allow topology optimization and mesostructure creation or lattice creation. And some people call it lattices and gyroids. So you'll be able to create objects like this. We can actually already create parts like this. We did. That's, of course, what this is because we've had the capabilities for a while. We're just working on exposing that out into this user interface in a very logical way so that people can use it. Um, what that allows us to do uh, is have things like um, the, the very complex lattice and gyroids that you can add to your shapes. Uh, we call them intelligent lattices, and um, they, that would be um, a, a way to describe complex mathematical shapes very quickly. Even though these are complex looking, each of these are created in a matter of a split second. Uh, they're very quick to create. Again, it's the power of the true solid API working in the background. Uh, someone asked, is there a free academic version? Um, in terms of pricing in general, I'd say please contact us, info at frustum.com. Uh, I'm actually going to flip to the last slide here. There's my email. If uh, if you want to shoot me a note too, I'll make sure it gets to the right person. Um, we we our pricing is different than it is with the, uh, the the website. There's not a free academic version of the desktop, uh, but you'll find a very affordable option on the web. Again, it's just a somewhat limited is scope to what you can do uh, relative to the desktop version. Uh, someone asks. Um, is it available for Mac? No, not right now. Right now, this is Windows only. Good question. Does it use multiple cores on the CPU? Absolutely. Uh, more the merrier. I wish I had more on mine to uh, to really make it sing. And uh, like I said, if you, you have a high-end workstation, then uh, you'll really see some great results. Um, can you manipulate the uh, geometry back in CAD? That's a very popular question. It's a very good question. The output of Generate is an STL. Uh, like most topology optimization, if not all topology optimization tools, um, the future will yield something where you might be able to save it as BREP or solid geometry, uh, but we're still in R&D with that. It's a very complex problem. If I go back one slide, you can imagine representing uh, any of these geometries uh, purely as solids, including all of the blending that occurs where the lattice structures hit the more regular geometry. Uh, it's not simple, so it's not a simple problem. So right now we have full control over the resolution of the SDL export, and that's how we send data to to, to CAM or to the added manufacturer vendors. Is it possible to use several load cases in optimization? Yes, of course. Uh, every example I showed, except for the first one used, um, I think at least two load cases, and to my knowledge, there's not a limit on the load cases that you can set up. Uh, and another question about optimizing multiple bodies simultaneously. And uh, um, yes, now, as we showed before, you can have multiple generative bodies. Um, is there a trial version available for in-house testing? Um, yeah, we understand, look, you're gonna try before you buy. Um, so you know, if you will contact a member of our sales team, again, info at frustum.com is the easiest to remember, send a note. Um, uh, someone on our sales team will get back to you, perhaps set up a demonstration or an, a follow-up call with you. Um, 
we will kind of sort out and see if you are you know truly interested and you want to try it out we understand um we, you know we can make a trial version available but um again we're not going to put it just up directly on the site just you need to contact us and let's let's have a conversation and, and see if it's applicable to you and that's all the questions that we had and we're kind of right up against our time limit so i think i'm gonna uh say thank you to everyone um, i appreciate uh the time and attention um, with this there's a recording we will make the recording rather available to everyone, uh, potentially this afternoon, as soon as this afternoon, as soon as uh, it's made available to us, and we'll send it around so that you can feel free to share it with your colleagues. And um, uh, again, we we hope that you'll contact us and uh, uh, we look forward to um, seeing what kind of things we can help you uh, generatively design. Thanks everyone.